What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, we gotta talk about the anion gap. I uh, posted a video to TikTok lately, and um, it's obvious that we need to discuss metabolic acidosis a step further in specific regard to the anion gap. You don't wanna miss this. Let's dive in. All right, so as I said, we're talking all about the anion gap. Before we jump into that, do me a favor, head over to respiratorycoach.com. You'll find a TMC and the CSC boot camps there. They are there to aid, assist, and augment you and your knowledge in preparing to pass those credentialing exams on the first attempt. Go check that out, I'd greatly appreciate it. Let's talk about the anion gap. On the screen that you see right now, there are two blood gases, two separate patients with the same blood gas. Now, the question is, is what's the difference? You see, the problem is, is that if you interpret these two blood gases, you will get the same answer. You've got an acidosis caused by a low bicarb and you have a low CO2. These patients, both of these patients are likely hyperventilating or blowing CO2 off to help increase their pH. This would likely be called what we know as Cushmall's respirations. Now, the problem with these two blood gases being side by side is, is that not both of these patients are presenting with the same problem and need the same treatment. You see, that's, that's where metabolic acidosis gets complicated. And that is the purpose of this video. So what we have to do here is we have to tell you Every single time you ever look at a patient with a metabolic acidosis, you need to understand the anion gap because understanding the anion gap will prevent you from saying something silly like give bicarb. That is sometimes the right answer, but not always. Giving bicarb to a metabolic acidosis patient is not always the best answer. That's why we're doing this video. Now, we're going to come back to this in a second, okay? Before we do that, let's talk about the anion gap. When we come over here, we're going to see... Now, I know this looks confusing, right? But just bear with me. I'm going to help you make sense here, right? Because we're going to go to Egan's chapter 14 in the 13th edition, page 295. And um, Egan says the same thing. It says, it is important to identify the underlying cause talking about metabolic acidosis. When, 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 when a metabolic acidosis presents, it's important to what? Identify the underlying cause. Analysis of plasma electrolytes helps distinguish between these two types of metabolic acidosis. Specifically measuring the anion gap helps make the distinction. So don't take my word for it. That's straight out of Egan's. Now what we know here is that when we talk about the anion gap, we have to understand what are we talking about? We're respiratory therapists. How often do we look at electrolytes? Maybe not as often as we should, because in this example, you're gonna see where it becomes very, very important. Now, this is where I want you to focus, these two right here. What we know, straight out of Egan's, the law of electroneutrality states that the total number of positive charges must equal the total number of negative charges. That's what we call electroneutrality. That's how the body functions. And so when we look at our positively charged um, electrolytes, we see that our big one here is sodium. Now, potassium falls in this equation also, but for the most part, it's such a small number that it's been eliminated from the calculation. So I'm not going to talk about potassium. Essentially, what we know is that sodium must equal chloride and bicarb plus this little box up here that stands for non-volatile acids. Now, what are non-volatile acids? Well, these are things like lactic acid. These are things um, like um, diabetic keto acids. That's what we're talking about right there. There's lots of more of them, but, but, but that's the main, the two big ones for this video, okay? 
Now, what we realize is that these two boxes must be equal. So if something changes in one, then something has to change in the other, but these boxes are always going to be equal. Now, pretend that this box stays right here. When we look at this box, we realize that it is now like this. This is a decrease in bicarb. Okay? We agree that our bicarb box has gotten smaller. Look what has happened to our chloride box. Our chloride box has gotten bigger. Look, it's way up here now. You see, this is the basis for which it stands. Because we know that, that in normal, normal physiology, bicarb and chloride have a uh, inverse relationship with one another. So if bicarb goes down, chloride goes up. If, 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 if bicarb increases, say with COPD to compensate for chronic ventilatory failure, then we see where we have a decrease in our chloride because this box gets bigger. That, that's, that's, that's understanding COPD um, at a greater extent is realizing that, oh, I'm not shocked that they are hypochloremic because their bicarb is increased. But look at this box right here. The non-volatile acid box is still relatively small. It hasn't changed at all. You see, what's happening right here is a loss of bicarb. That, that's a loss of bicarb. And when the body loses bicarb, then chloride goes up. Non-volatile acids don't increase. This is, this is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. That's what we're seeing right here. This is still a metabolic acidosis because we have a decrease in our bicarb. But it's a, it's a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. If you want to give bicarb to a patient with a decreased um, bicarbonate level, this is the patient you want to do it for because they need more bicarb supply. But look what happens in the next scenario. You see here, our chloride from our original box of normal or balanced stays the same. Chloride stayed the same. Bicarb did what? Went down. What's happened to our anion gap? It is much larger now. You see, this is what happens with lactic acid. This is what happens with diabetic ketoacidosis, is that your increase in non-volatile acids are what are occupying the bicarb. Remember, bicarb is a base or a buffer for acids. I keep saying non-volatile acids, though hydrogen is a volatile acid, and that's what bicarb uh, uh, buffers in normal physiology. But when we get an increase in our non-volatile acids, then they too will occupy the bicarb. Now the question is, is, well, the bicarb is still low. Yes, the bicarb is low, but has the bicarb exited the body? Is it a depleted amount of bicarb or is it just occupied by something other than hydrogen? That's that scenario. So when you have diabetic ketoacidosis, when you have lactic acidosis and you have an increase in your anion gap, that is when you, the answer is not to give bicarb. I'm not saying that you won't give bicarb depending on the severity of the acidosis. I'm saying that the answer to the solution is not to give bicarb. If it's diabetic ketoacidosis, you got to give insulin. If it is lactic acidosis due to tissue hypoxia, then you got to perfuse better. You see, you got to increase tissue oxygenation because we know lactic acid is a byproduct of tissue hypoxia due to anaerobic metabolism. That's what happens here. So you can give bicarb all day long here, but if you don't fix the tissue hypoxia, you're still going to have a buildup of lactic acid. If you don't fix the diabetic ketoacidosis, then they're still going to be in DKA with or without the additional administration of bicarb. So 
This is not okay. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, what is an increased anion gap? Well, according to Egan's, the normal anion gap range is eight to 16. So when you do this formula, you add up sodium, you say sodium minus chloride plus bicarb. And when you subtract bicarb and, chlo and chloride from sodium, you're left with your non-volatile acids, aka your anion gap. That's the story. That's the story that as respiratory therapists, we need to understand so we can display and put our knowledge uh, at the bedside and understanding that giving bicarb is not the answer to every metabolic acidosis scenario that presents. That's what it comes down to. So let's go back and look at these two blood gases. When I look at this, I now know that I need more information. If I look at this patient and I go, okay, let me look at my anion gap, and I see that my anion gap is eight, then I go, that's normal. This metabolic acidosis is due to a loss of bicarb, and we need to replenish that loss of bicarb. That's this scenario. But if I come over here and I have an anion gap of 18, then I know that I have a buildup of non-volatile acids and giving bicarb is not going to be the end game solution to this problem. That's the anion gap. That's the value of the anion gap. And that's why you need to understand and know and apply the anion gap to your everyday practice as you take care of these patients in metabolic acidosis. We don't sit back and say, as metabolic, we don't need to deal with that. We say, hold up, my patient's breathing like this because of a metabolic acidosis, and I know the difference between the two. So um, that is uh, the anion gap. I am respiratory coach. Do me a favor. If you're here right now on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave me a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on this video, social media, Instagram, TikTok, at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn, at Joe Lewis. Don't forget about the TMC and CSC boot camps at respiratorycoach.com, right there to help you pass those exams on the first attempt. Remember, average is easy. Don't be it.